Mama Murdered a Podcast. We're covering a case that is going to break your heart, piss you off, and probably make your tummy hurt. I'm sorry about that. But this week, we're covering the case of Brittany Gosney and six-year-old James Hutchinson. So, with all that being said, and without further ado, let's get it. Brittany Gosney was a 29-year-old single mom living in Middletown, Ohio with her three young kids, 9-year-old Rachel, 7-year-old Lucas, and 6-year-old James. Now, I'm not saying this to be judgy because uh, you do you, boo, but all three of Brittany's kids did have different dads, so she did have three different baby daddies, but like I said... That's fine in most cases, but I guess I'm kind of judging Brittany because, as we all learn, she's a sorry excuse for a human. Now, while her own childhood and upbringing wasn't a walk in the park, people do have shitty childhoods and grow up to be perfectly good parents and contributing members of society, and they do that all the time. And a lot of the times, it ends up being those same kids that had those really bad childhoods that grow up and become the best parents just because they somehow manage to break those cycles of generational trauma and they try to do better. That is not the case for Brittany. So while she did have a rough upbringing, she also actively chose to be a shitty parent as an adult. But let's talk a little bit about Brittany's own childhood before we get any further into this. So when Brittany was pretty young, her own parents separated and surprisingly for the times, Brittany's dad was actually the one who was given custody of Brittany. So, this has to kind of say something about Brittany's own mom and her parents in style because it's typically the mom who's granted full custody or at least the mom is typically the one who is deemed like the, you know, sole guardian of her kids in the custody battle unless there's proof that it would be in the best interest for the kids to have the dad be granted full custody. So, in order for Britney's dad to have been given full custody of Britney after her parents split up, that has to shine some kind of light on Britney's own mom as far as either her parenting style or her situation at the time. But after Britney's dad gained custody of her, she was then removed from her dad's care when she was 12 years old. So, obviously, mm, neither of Britney's own parents were winning any Parent of the Year awards. But it was at 12 years old when Brittany was removed from her dad's custody that it was learned that she was actually pregnant. And after learning that she was pregnant, it was also learned that Brittany had been the victim of sexual abuse and rape multiple times. Which, obviously, this is horrible. It's trauma that I'm sure will be carried with her throughout her entire life. That's going to be something that cannot be undone. And I know that a lot of times with situations like this, especially at such a young age, that sexual abuse, molestation, and rape may even kind of skew what you deem love to be at that young of an age, which in turn usually just continues that cycle of abuse. If you grow up thinking that sexual assault and sexual abuse is what people that love you do to you, then that's how a lot of those sexually abusive and physically abusive adult relationships come about. Because you truly believe that that's what love is supposed to look like. And you honestly believe that love is sexual abuse or love is mentally and physically being abused. And so the cycle continues. And this is one of those cases where we hear about their childhood and we start feeling really bad for that person and the way that their life started out. And that's fine. We can all feel sorry for 12-year-old Brittany who got pregnant because of a sexual abuse. But adult Brittany 
grown ass adult Brittany as a parent, that's where all those feelings of sympathy just go out the window for her. And you'll see why as we get further into this. So Brittany did end up delivering the baby that she was pregnant with at 12 years old. And that baby was adopted by another family after being delivered. And I'm just going to say it, that baby being adopted was probably the best thing to ever happen to that child because I would not let Brittany Gosney as an adult babysit my new fish, much less let her be around my kids or my dog. But <laughs> let's get back to the timeline because after Brittany gave birth and that baby was adopted into another family, Brittany herself was then placed into different group homes and foster homes until she just eventually aged out of the system at 18 years old. So it's like I keep saying, Brittany had a super traumatic and chaotic childhood, and that's not really debatable. But what she does once she's out of the system and out of these situations that are out of her control, those things are very much debatable. Because after aging out of the system, Brittany goes on to have three more kids pretty quickly in succession to one another. And those next three kids were delivered when Brittany was 20, 22, and 23. So back to back to back. Now, Brittany, her three kids, and her most recent baby daddy, Louis, were all struggling at this point. So, Louis would have been Brittany's youngest son, six-year-old James's dad. But Brittany, Louis, and all three of Brittany's kids were having trouble with housing security. So, Louis's sister, being the saint that she is, decided that Brittany, Louis, and all three of the kids could just move in with her and her husband at their house. So, Lewis's sister and her husband opened their house up to five extra people, which not a lot of people would be willing to do. Now, Lewis's sister is Priscilla, and her husband is James Hamilton, and they had been married for 17 years at the time that Brittany, Lewis, and the three kids moved into their house. And I feel like I may have just confused myself, and probably y'all too, so let me try to say this in one sentence so that maybe all the names don't get so confusing. Brittany Gosney and her three kids along with her boyfriend slash latest baby daddy, Lewis, have all moved in to Priscilla and James Hamilton's house. Priscilla Hamilton is Lewis's sister. So like I said, Priscilla and James had been married for 17 years at the time that Brittany, Lewis, and the three kids moved into their house. So Priscilla was nice enough to open her house up to Brittany and all three of her young kids. And then what does Brittany do to thank Priscilla for helping her through these really hard times? Because if you guessed that Brittany started having an affair with Priscilla's husband, James Hamilton, then you would be correct. Because that's exactly what Brittany did. She started sleeping with Priscilla's husband, James, which just makes this situation so much worse. Because the only reason that Brittany and her three kids even had that roof over their heads to start with is because Brittany and Lewis were together and had a kid together. So, not only was Brittany having an affair with James, but she was also cheating on her latest baby daddy, Louis. And naturally, when Priscilla found out that Brittany and her husband were sleeping together, she made both of them get out. And I'll just say this, Priscilla handled this so much more gracefully than I ever would have. Because y'all would have been sharing my mugshot on the Mama Murdered a Podcast Facebook page if I was Priscilla. But she didn't do that. She didn't do anything crazy. She just told him to get out of her house. This would have been around the middle of 2020. And at this time, Brittany was 28 years old and James Hamilton, who she had been having the affair with, was 48 years old. And they've both been officially kicked out of Priscilla Hamilton's house. So by about the beginning of 2021, Brittany, her three kids, and her new boo thing, James, they're all just kind of hotel hopping, couch surfing, and just finding different places to sleep. So, now Brittany's latest baby daddy, Louis, is out of the picture, and she is with James, who she was having the affair with. So, Brittany, James, and all three of Brittany's kids all hopped around from place to place until I believe it was February of 2021 that James and Brittany were finally able to secure a house in Middletown, Ohio. And while I was looking into how Brittany and James were finally able to be able to afford to move into their own house... I found a fundraiser that Brittany created on Facebook in January of 2021 where she was asking people to donate money for her so that she and James would be able to afford to move into a new house. And by posting this fundraiser, Brittany was able to raise a whole $90. But during that same article that I was reading, 
I also found a different fundraiser that Brittany had also created on Facebook in May of 2019. And in that fundraising post, Brittany says that she's a full-time stay-at-home mom and that she only needed $900 to be able to use that money to help her move. And she literally said only $900, as if that's not a good bit of money. Which, finding these fundraisers that Brittany had set up, that kind of led me down a little bit of a Facebook rabbit hole, where Brittany had her occupation listed as a full-time mommy. I also found some posts that Brittany made where she posted and praised her new boyfriend, James, calling him her quote-unquote everything. Brittany would also make a lot of these, like, picture collages that would be picturing all three of her kids, and it would be, like, stuff with banners around the pictures that would either say things like, Happy St. Patrick's Day or Happy Valentine's Day. And maybe if you didn't know anything about Brittany, then these posts would look like just a proud mom showing off her cute kiddos online. But those kids, sadly, were not living this kind of loving life that Brittany portrayed on Facebook. Brittany did later claim that after she and James and the kids had moved into the new house in February of 2021, that James had become physically and emotionally abusive towards all three of her kids. And I don't know about y'all, but I feel like that would be my cue to get the hell out of Dodge. Mr. Dan Carlin, welcome to the History Shorts Podcast. Happy to do it. I wish you all the luck in the world, and I'm glad you're doing this too. Congratulations. Hi, everyone. My name is Peter Zablocki, a historian and a host of the History Shorts Podcast. If you are a fan of serious yet fun history, then it might be time to squeeze History Shorts into your daily routine. From everyday 10-minute episodes on often stupefying history to weekly interviews with top historians, the History Shorts Podcast is your one-stop shop for easily accessible history. See you on your favorite podcast app. And according to Brittany, James would also threaten to hog tie the kids as a way to get them to try to behave or do what he says. And yeah, you heard me right. I said hog tie the kids. He would threaten to hog tie her kids because none of these kids are biologically his. He's just like the new flavor of the month. But when he wasn't threatening to hogtie the kids, then he would punch them, not spank, not pop on the hand like you might pop the hand of a toddler, or even parents who do believe in spanking their kids, despite how you may feel about spankings. I can see how spanking a kid is not the same as smacking them on the butt as hard as you possibly can. But he wasn't even doing just a regular old 90s kid specialty ass whooping. He was full fist punching these kids. He was not just giving them a spanking. And I just want to keep reiterating, these are not even his kids. And I'm, I mean, not that that would make a difference as far as making this right or wrong. But my point is like, where was Brittany when this was happening? And why was she okay with this? Because that's where I'm getting pissed off. Where was she? And why was she complacent with him using his grown ass man strength to close-handed punch her kids. I don't get it, y'all. I don't get it. And during police interviews and interrogations with James, he does admit to hog-tying the kids and punching them. And he claims that punching the kids was the worst thing that he'd ever done to the kids. So I kind of feel like if he's openly okay with admitting to punching and hog-tying them, that it's likely that that is not, in fact, the worst thing that he's done to them. That's just what he's willing to admit to. And from here, things escalate pretty quickly because according to Brittany's boyfriend, James, on February 26, 2021, Brittany actually went through with the threats to hogtie her kids as a form of punishment. He claims that as Brittany was tying up one of the three kids, James says that Brittany asked him to show her how to properly hogtie them because she had never done this before and he had. So, I'm not sure where James learned to hogtie people, but apparently, he's pretty good at it. And I'm sure none of us are wondering what these three kids did to deserve to be hogtied, because I can't think of anything on the planet that would make this okay. I don't see, I can't think of anything that could piss a parent off so bad that we feel like we need to hogtie our kids. 
I just don't. And from my understanding, this punishment was just for the kids being kids, doing very normal kid stuff. But when Brittany and James had had enough, Brittany decided to have James help her hogtie the kids. And James does later admit to all this in an interview with police. And in that interview, James says that they hogtied the kids using some rope that they already had and that they put all three of the kids in a closet that was only about three feet wide and they left them in that closet for about six hours. And I'm not doing this to be graphic, but I want you to imagine as an adult, not even as a kid, but as an adult, imagine laying on your stomach with your wrist and your ankles tied together behind your back And then laying like that for six whole hours in a tiny closet cramped with two other people. For six hours. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And if that wasn't bad enough, Brittany and James also came up with a way to keep all three of the kids quiet while they were in this closet tied up. Brittany decided that it would be a good idea to shove the kids' dirty underwear in their mouths as a way to keep them quiet while they were all three hogtied in a three-foot-wide closet for six hours. And Brittany does eventually admit to all of this in police interviews, and when she does admit to this, she also claims that she could hear James beating her kids before putting them in the closet. And the way that she makes the distinction of the word beaten just says it all. She's like, oh no, he was beating the kids, like really beating the kids. Which I feel like the phrasing is just all you need to know. Now, the youngest of these three kids was James, who was only six years old, and he had actually managed to get undone from the position of being hogtied, and when he had managed to wiggle and squirm his way free, he didn't try to run and get help, he didn't try to escape the house. Instead, he yells for his mom to let her know that he needed to use the restroom. He doesn't leave the closet to ask her if he can go use the restroom, he stays inside of the closet and yells out for his mom so that he wouldn't get in trouble for leaving the closet to go to the bathroom. You will never convince me that this is the first time that these kids have been punished in some ridiculously abusive way. But instead of letting James go to the restroom, Brittany's boyfriend, James, takes little six-year-old James back up to the closet and just ties him back up. And I just want to throw this out here, because Brittany's boyfriend does have the same name as her youngest son, James, even though he's not his father. I just want to keep that fresh in your mind throughout this entire episode. And sadly, we do later learn that six-year-old James's dad, Lewis, he had been trying to get in custody and visitation. He had been fighting with Brittany about seeing his son. So it's not like he just abandoned James and never spoke to him again. So back at the house, six-year-old James had been taken back to the closet and put back into the position of being hogtied. And Brittany later admits to police during an interview that when James took him back to the closet, that she could hear thuds and swats and what she thought might have been James abusing six-year-old little James. So she heard it, but she didn't do anything about it. That's just the kind of mom that Brittany is, though. So from here, we're rolling over into midnight, so it would technically be the next day. And mind you, these kids were still tied up in the closet at this point. But at about 3 a.m. on February 27th, 2021, Brittany takes the kids out of the closet, but she's not taking them out of the closet to let them go to bed or to apologize to them or even to sneak away from abusive James. No, 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 no. She takes them out of the closet and then puts them into her minivan and drives them to the Preble County Park. Yeah, she drives them to a local county park at 3 a.m. But why? Well, according to Brittany, she told investigators during an interview where she finally confessed to what happened that night. Brittany tells investigators that James had been kind of hinting around to the fact that she needed to get rid of her kids. He said that her kids were ill-mannered, that they were disrespectful, and that they just didn't listen. So, basically, she just needed to figure out a way to get rid of them, basically. So, what does Brittany do? She plans to drop the kids off at this park and just leave them there at 3 a.m. And as the questioning continues in the interrogation in the interview where Brittany confesses, Brittany does say that she and James had talked about this plan before. That James had kind of thrown out the idea of abandoning the kids at this park and leaving them there for the coyotes to eat them. I'm sorry, is this real life? Yes, yes it is. It's mind-blowing. 
Now, Brittany decides to just go through with this plan. She loads the kids up into her minivan without James, and she drives them to the Preble County Park to leave them there. Now, Brittany says that James didn't go with her to the park because he basically told her that he needed a break from the kids and that she needed to, quote-unquote, do something with them. I'm not sure how he needed a break from the kids when they've been in a closet for a whole ass six hours, but let's keep going. Now, this is not a county park that is like in a well-lit area with people and houses and businesses around. This county park is in the middle of like literally nowhere with nothing around and no one in sight. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it here because once Brittany confesses to what happens next, the story changes over the course of questioning and we may never know the whole truth of what happened that night. But I'm going to try to walk you through what Brittany claims happened and then how her story keeps changing. And then I'll just let you make your own decision, you know, once this episode is done. Then you can decide what you think happened. So Brittany first says that she drove the minivan with all three of her kids in the back to the county park and she parked in the parking lot. So then she says that her two older kids climbed out of the minivan when she told them to. But she says that her youngest child, who was six-year-old James, that he had kind of been pretending to be asleep. So since he wouldn't get out of the minivan on his own, she just pulled him out of the minivan and set him on the ground beside of her two older kids. Brittany says that when she pulled James out of the minivan and set him down with his two older siblings, that James went from pretending to be asleep to being in complete hysterics, which I'm sure he was. He was six years old and his mom's trying to leave him in this dark ass woods by himself with his siblings. Brittany says that six year old James begged her not to leave him and that he cried and I'm just, he was probably mortified. But instead of comforting her six-year-old, Brittany gets back into the driver's seat of the minivan and she drives off. And according to Brittany, which I don't think any of us believe her at this point, but according to Brittany, when she went to drive off in the minivan after leaving her kids there alone, six-year-old James had been holding on to the handle of the back door of the minivan. And essentially, since she kept driving, he was being drugged by the minivan as his mom drove, leaving them there in the woods. Brittany tells investigators that once she noticed that James had grabbed the handle of the minivan's door, that she looked back in her rearview mirror to check on James, not to stop and check on him, she just checked in her rearview mirror, and she says that James had tried to stand up, but that he couldn't catch his balance, so he fell on the ground again. And Brittany's explaining all this to the investigators, and she tells him that she could also hear her other two kids screaming as she drove away. And all of this is happening at 3 a.m. in February in Ohio. Not only did she just leave her kids at a county park and abandon them in hopes that coyotes would come and get them, but if the coyotes didn't get them, then the freezing cold temperatures definitely would. And she's doing all of this while her boyfriend James is back at home just chilling. Because he's not even with her when she's doing this. I promise y'all though, Brittany Gosney is just as bad as James Hamilton, if not worse. Now, Brittany says that when six-year-old James was trying to catch his balance, that she saw him fall, and she saw that he hit his head while she was watching all this happen from her rearview mirror. But she doesn't stop. She doesn't check on little James. She just keeps driving. She then texts her boyfriend, James, on the way home from abandoning her three kids in the park, and she texts him to tell him that she had left them in the park at the parking lot, and that she thinks that little James had been hurt. So, Brittany's boyfriend, James, texts back, and he tells Brittany to go back and get the kids. At that point, Brittany turns around and starts the drive back to the spot where she just dropped all three of her kids off. But at that point, Brittany had already been gone for long enough that her two oldest kids had managed to walk roughly a quarter of a mile in the direction that Brittany had been driving when she dropped them off. Brittany stopped the van and picks up the two oldest kids when she sees them walking, and then she continues driving to the parking lot where she originally left the kids to pick up James. But when she makes it to the parking lot, her two older kids tell her that James had been dragged by the minivan when she drove off since, you know, he had been holding on to the van door. The two oldest kids also tell Brittany that after six-year-old James had been dragged, that he had also stumbled to catch his balance and that he had fell and hit his head. 
Now, it's only at this point that Brittany gets out to check on little James, and she sees that he's not breathing and that he had already passed away. Brittany just picks up James's lifeless body and puts him into her minivan with her older kids, and she just drives them all back home. And these two older kids, oh, poor things, I'm so glad they're better off now. I'm just going to say that. Now, Brittany arrives back home where her boyfriend James is waiting on her, and she fills James in on what had happened to six-year-old little James. Brittany says that she then carried James's little body into the house where she put him on the bare living room floor. Brittany's boyfriend James then picks little James up and carries him to an upstairs bedroom where he lays him underneath a window on the ground. Brittany and her boyfriend left James's body there for a full 24 hours in that bedroom, and they knew that he was dead. They, you know, they know this is on them. So instead of calling 911 or driving him to the closest hospital to try to see if life-saving measures could be performed to bring him back, instead of doing any of those things, they just leave James's little body in an upstairs bedroom while they try to figure out how to dispose of his body without getting caught by police. So, on February 28th, 2021, Brittany and James removed James's little body from the house while Brittany's two older kids were asleep. They placed his lifeless body into the minivan, and then they used the same ropes that they had used to hog tie the kids up. They used those same ropes to tie a cinder block around James's body, where they then drove for about an hour to the Ohio State River, where they disposed of six-year-old James's body. They did this by stopping on a bridge where Brittany then opened the back passenger side of the door on her van. Brittany said she was in charge of carrying six-year-old James by his feet and legs, and her boyfriend James carried the upper part of his body. Brittany says after removing his body from the van that Brittany and James tossed six-year-old James's body over the bridge and into the banks on the river. Brittany later recalls hearing a loud splash from the water where the bricks had been so heavy, and after this, Brittany and James tried to get their story straight. They then try to figure out what to tell people who ask about James. They try to figure out how they're going to explain this mix, missing six-year-old boy. You know, how are they going to explain this away to police? Because later on that same day, after dumping her own kid into the Ohio State River, Brittany, her boyfriend James, and her two remaining kids all walk into the Middletown Police Department to report six-year-old James as a missing person. There was not an ounce of desperation in her voice or even a sprinkle of worry or hysteria. When Brittany Galsney walked into the police station and told officers that her six-year-old son had been missing for a few hours. Brittany also tells officers that in those few hours, they had been searching all over for James on their own before they came into the police station to report him missing. Okay, Casey Anthony. <laughs> That's how you know she's full of shit. No good parent, no loving parent, is letting their kid be missing for a few hours without calling police as soon as they realize their kid isn't where they're supposed to be. And police take note of this too. But they have a missing child to try to find. So they kind of put Brittany and James on the back burner and they arrange for search parties and volunteers to go out and come through every possible place that six-year-old James could be. Now, when Brittany tells the officers that James had been missing for a few hours... What she actually said was that James had been missing since 4 a.m. And it was like 10 or 10.30 a.m. when they walked into the police department. And I don't know about y'all, but that's more than just a few hours by my calculations. That sounds more like a six-hour workday instead. And it is actually insane to me that Brittany thought that saying a six-year-old being missing at 4 a.m. was a good idea. It's not like she could have said like, hey, I thought maybe he was at a neighbor's house playing or, you know, I didn't realize that he wasn't at the neighbor's house. Like, what is your six-year-old doing out of bed at 4 a.m.? There's no other place your six-year-old should be besides bed at 4 a.m. Like, what are you even talking about? Now, as soon as Brittany, her boyfriend James, and her two remaining kids walk into the police department, and as soon as officers hear this story that Brittany and James are trying to spin, you can kind of tell immediately that they're suspicious of both Brittany and James. So they actually go ahead and separate Brittany and James from one another, and they go ahead and put them in two different interrogation rooms for questioning, which is perfect. We love to see good police work. So Brittany is taken into a separate interrogation room from the one that her boyfriend James was taken to, and Brittany is questioned for somewhere around three hours to start with, 
And I'm just telling you right now, if either of my kids go missing and the police try to question me for three hours, I will burn that whole shit to the ground trying to get out of there to search for my kid. (laughs) But not Brittany. She is just so chill. She's telling the police how much she loves her kids, how she would never do anything to hurt them, how, you know, she only makes them stand in the corner as a form of punishment, and the list of bullshit goes on and on and on. And the officer who is interrogating Brittany, he needs an award and a raise. Because he started off by befriending Brittany and, you know, making her feel like he was someone safe to talk to. And then he just kind of leaves her there by herself for like a half an hour. But when he comes back in, he comes back in to let Brittany know that her boyfriend James had essentially just thrown her under the bus. And, you know, James wasn't taking blame for anything that happened to six-year-old James. And that was really all it took for Brittany to switch up her story. This is when she tries to lie her way out of the murder of her six-year-old son. She tried saying that her and her kids were out driving and that they stopped at the county park to use the bathroom and that James fell and hit his head and that that was how he died. What they were doing driving around the park at 4 a.m., nobody knows. That's bullshit. That's a lie. And Brittany sticks with this story of the disposal of James's body, though. She claims that they took James's body back to the house where they left it for 24 hours, and then they dumped it into the river. And this is what I mean when I say that this detective doing the questioning, he's a freaking genius because he played Brittany and James against each other like a professional chess player. The investigator played them off of each other perfectly until Brittany finally broke down and told the investigator what she says is the truth. Now, what Brittany says is the truth is that she dropped James and her two other kids off in the parking lot at the park and dragged James with the car and then dumped his body in the river after keeping his ha- his body at the house for 24 hours. According to Brittany, that's the truth for real this time. And the entire time that she's telling investigators what happened that night, she shows absolutely no emotion whatsoever. She doesn't shed a tear. She doesn't get shaky. Her voice never cracks. She literally could not care less that she's explaining how she murdered her own six-year-old kid. And when investigators are in with James talking to him and asking him questions, he tells investigators that it was never his idea to drop the kids off at the park and abandon them. Instead, he did say that he told Brittany to drop them off at the park and to just drive away for a minute or two just to scare them and then go pick them back up. Also, not a good idea. And this is about the time in the interrogation that James admits to abusing the kids, punching the kids, And he even tells investigators that if and when they find six-year-old James's body, that there will be bruises on his body that were caused by him. James also doesn't show any emotion while he's telling investigators his side of the story. And the only time that he does show any emotion at all is when the police tell him that he's going to be charged. But before we go any further, I do want to bring up something that Brittany told investigators during the questioning because she did try to say that she had tried to relinquish her rights as a mom before to all three of her kids because she had been struggling and she felt like she couldn't handle life as a mom, which is fine. If you know that you're not mentally, physically, or emotionally able to keep your kids, and if you know that you're not in the right state of mind to keep them safe, healthy, and loved, then by all means, find a couple that has fertility issues or find someone who can't carry a baby or go through with an adoption. Relinquish your rights as a parent. But then afterwards, take your ass to the OBGYN and get on some birth control. Don't just keep popping out more kids if you already can't take care of the kids you had. And I don't even think with her having three kids and wanting to give up her rights as a mom, I mean, I could at least respect that decision. Maybe don't have three kids and then decide you don't want them. But I would at least respect her decision as a mom as in putting the interest of her kids first. But that's not exactly how Brittany Gosney rolls. And to hear Brittany tell it, She claims that when she tried to relinquish her parental rights, that she was denied. Which I'm also going to call bullshit on that. (laughs) And then as it turns out, when it was time for this case to go to trial, and the prosecution starts digging through Brittany's past and her records with social services or, you know, whoever else, there is absolutely zero evidence to show that Brittany ever actually tried to have her parental rights relinquished. So again, I was right, and she's full of shit. And it's hard for me to even believe that she thought that this lie wasn't going to be checked into. I don't know. She really doesn't think anything through, I guess. But the minivan was impounded by investigators, and there was evidence found that suggests that James's remains had been transported in that van. 
So, obviously, Brittany and James are held in custody while the investigation unfolds. Finally, on March 8, 2021, Brittany and James make a court appearance where they pled not guilty. There were a slew of different charges filed against both Brittany and James, and some of Brittany's charges included a single count of murder, one count of involuntary manslaughter, one count of tampering with evidence, five counts of endangering children, three counts of kidnapping, three counts of abduction, and two counts of gross abuse of a corpse. And with all those charges and her confessions, she still had the audacity to plead not guilty. Now, as far as James was concerned, some of his charges included three counts of kidnapping, abduction, and endangering children, tampering with evidence, and gross abuse of a corpse, which again, he pled not guilty to, and I'm not sure how or why, but somehow or another, Brittany ended up with the option to take a plea deal, which she took. And this plea deal would consist of Brittany pleading guilty to murder and two counts of endangering children. Brittany did try to go with the not guilty by reason of insanity, but that did not work out in her favor. Now, in August of 2021, James pled guilty to kidnapping, gross abuse of a corpse, and two counts of endangering children. And when it came time for the sentence and hearings, the judge implemented the maximum sentence for the charges that Brittany pled guilty to, and she was sentenced to at least 21 years in prison, which if you ask me, I don't think is anywhere close to enough time, but I'm not a judge. But also the way I understood it when I read it is that her sentence could be anywhere from 21 years in prison to life in prison, and that that would all depend on whether or not she could be deemed safe to enter society again or not. So I think that would kind of be up to the parole board. And now as far as James's sentence in here goes, he was sentenced to 19 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 15 years is served. But that's also going to be up to the parole board. And these cases are always so crazy to me because the teachers, classmates, friends, neighbors, etc. that come out and speak out about how amazing these kids are after their deaths and during their trials, it It seems to be everyone except for the two people who were supposed to love and praise that child. Because when people gave testimony to the court about the kind of kid that James was, it was nothing but positive things, encouraging words, and praises for how far he could have gone. Now, despite multiple searches done to recover James's body, his body still has not been recovered. But one thing that Rosa Parks Elementary School did, which is the school that James attended, they did a bench in the memory of James that sits outside of the school. The school says that they hope that by sitting this bench outside of the school in James's honor, that it will shine a light on child abuse. Now, James's dad, Lewis, is another victim in this case. He has struggled with the death of his son since learning the facts of what happened. He also says he's been struggling with PTSD, trying to cope through this loss. And that is Brittany Gosney and her adorable, adorable son, James. I think that's all I have for you this week. If you're a member of Patreon, there will be a new episode Friday. If y'all are ready for the merch link, let me know. I'm excited to release that. And other than that, let's do it again. Same time, same place, next Wednesday. See you then. That's how my mama murdered a podcast.